Good afternoon. That was quite an introduction. Uh, only part of it is true. I don't really get muddy on my farm, uh, but I just enjoy the tranquility and it's given me a lot of time to think about this, what I'm going to share with you. Completely different from what I used to do before. What I'm going to be talking about is chasing infinity, which is the growth story. Growth is the big word in our lives. Everything has to grow. Growth. Now, phase one, it all started in 1750. We got all these wonderful things, cars, air travel, telecom, computers, and all that. For 200 years, these good things happened. So we thought the sky was the limit. But suddenly, post-1970, all the bad things started. Species extinction, water crisis, falling water tables, forests gone, etc., which we call ecological collapse. Good things, suddenly bad things. And then, just when we thought that was bad enough, more bad things happened, this time with your money. Volatile markets, increasing prices, debt crisis, financial bubbles, failing banks, post-2000. So, what is the connection between all these good things that we feel we ought to be working for and the eco-collapse, which is life collapsing, and economic collapse, which is your money collapsing? And I propose to convince you that this is the cause of all three of these. It's, we never see it that way, but growth, which is our religion, it is the biggest global religion, is growth. It is beyond Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, all of them combined. It's a faith that things should keep growing more. I mean quantitative growth, GDP growth. I don't mean qualitative growth. This is the history of growth. From 1750, it went crazy. It was never like that. 10,000 years back, the world worked perfectly fine. Two questions. Is perpetual growth desirable? Most people say, yeah, yeah, of course. We get jobs, we get this, we get that, we get progress. But is perpetual growth possible? So I'm going to start with the second one because, first of all, let me show you whether it's possible or not. We have a mind. Mind comes up with a concept. Concept are right and red. Say, lift up this glass is a concept. But to lift it, you need your body. The, this I. I didn't use this intentionally, but <laughs> just happens to be there. Um, that is reality. So the body can do it, the glass is small enough, you've managed to achieve the concept. Then the mind says lift up something heavier because you're into growth, lift a chair. The mind can do it again, the body can do it again. By the way, body is reality, mind is concept. So you can come up with any concept and you keep going through heavier and heavier things and finally your mind says lift this up if anybody can help me with that. So obviously the body cannot do that. Minds have no limits. Bodies have limits. This is like going back to KG. But we need to go back to KG to question our fundamental belief in this religion called growth. So what is the ultimate concept that we came up with? We said money. Money is a concept. Nobody eats money. You buy things with money. And, and that comes from the mind of the financial system. The whole system collectively decides this is money and this is how it should behave. And it should grow. How do we define money? We say, first of all, money is equal to value, which is not true. This is bread, this is 10 rupees. You eat the bread, you don't eat the 10 rupees. So money maps value, it's not value. But we've forgotten that. So each time I draw a circle, it's a new concept. Okay, so the next one immediately was, hey, this money should grow. It should earn interest, you should invest it. And the moment you add that concept of time value of money, you have started this vector of linear growth of money. 7%, 7%, 7%. But it's so good that you say, hey, why not add another concept? Why not add the interest back and earn interest on the interest? Wow, now your money is going like this. Fabulous, just look at this. It doesn't compare, this curve becomes vertical actually. It never even reaches the right side of the page. It's a mathematical impossibility, but we believe in it. And it's so good that we say, let this happen forever. So this is when we say growth in all our discussions, banks, FDs, finance minister, he doesn't mean growth. He means perpetual, exponential, quantitative growth, which is a very different monster. This is the money onion. It looks like an onion, right? Just layers of concepts. So we have decided that money should behave like this. But this looks dangerous. But why do we like it? 
and that's what we call economics, 10 lakhs at 7% will double in 10 years. In just 10 decades, it will become 100 crores. It looks like this. Fantastic. No wonder we believe that it should happen. But what nobody tells you is that so does the use of your resources. Here's a graph that nobody will show you. Money has grown from 1830 exponentially. This is money, red, energy. You need energy in the same proportion. It is not money that has made energy grow. It is energy that has made money grow. It is with energy that you make products, services, this thing, that thing. And that's how your money has been growing. And that started from 1750 because we discovered stored sunlight. 500 million years of stored sunlight, a savings account, never to happen again. And 1860, it was oil, which was even more, even more deadly. What, what oil can do, coal cannot do. And that's what started this whole crazy curve. So that's the difference. Economics is a mind game. You create a concept from your mind called money, and you make the laws for it yourself. And you expect that the body of the earth and reality should follow it, simply because you've made those laws, simply because you say money has time value. It should earn interest, it should compound. And this is called energetics. This is a subject which I want to introduce in universities around the world. Everything follows energetics. Nothing follows economics. Your body follows energetics. Clouds follow energetics. Rivers follow energetics. Forests follow energetics. The laws of energetics are defined by God. The laws of economics are defined by man. You can decide who's going to win. What is energetics? For a start, the earth is finite. You're using the energy only from the earth. Anybody who believes that the sun is running our modern world is deluded. We are running it on fossil fuels, which is 500 million years of sunlight. And all resources, this you won't learn anywhere in any school, but all resources follow a bell curve, which means that it reaches the peak when half of it is finished. When half the oil is finished in an oil well, it starts slowing down. When half the uh, copper ore is finished in a copper mine, the output goes down. They don't teach you anywhere. They imagine that you get it at whatever speed you want, but that's not true. So the second half goes slower. So you're in trouble when you've reached the peak. And this follows the laws of geology. These are not man-made laws. These are God-made laws. Are you going to contest geology? We think that we can with our creativity, which is why we, we started off with this concept called money. So we have three phases from the, when the industrial age started. For the first phase, the earth gives you exponentially, whether it be oil or copper or water or anything. If you want more, it gives you more. So you could make your money grow in a real way from here to here. You actually made more products. You could actually make more cars, trucks, trains, planes, etc. This is phase one, paradise times. But second phase, it goes in a different direction. So this part was fine, but the second part, and this we managed to do it with these four laws, okay? These are the four laws that allowed us to make money go there, but we got the energy in proportionately. But when now the earth behaves like this, and you're saying, no, my money should go like this, there's a big gap, which is a differential between the real products you've made and you're imagining your money has grown here. So what did we do? We again relied on our mind. We said, let's make one more concept. So we added another concept to our money onion. It's called the stock market. Now, stocks existed, but stocks used to be privately held. The moment you make a stock market, you're, you're, you've started a casino, which means you are betting on stocks. If I take a glass of milk and pass it around 10, 20, 40, 80, 10,000, but the glass still feeds one baby, what have you increased? Nothing. You've created a symbolic notional casino. It's a gambling den. It is the, it's an institutionalized gambling den, which we call Wall Street, Nalal Street, God knows what street. But this, this is the way our mind works. And we honestly start believing that this is true. And this is actual reality. But then again, the curve needed to go up. The differential increased. So we said, OK, let's introduce fractional reserve banking. Because when you lend money, you get interest. When you lend more money, you get more interest. So the bank was allowed to lend more and more and more and more and more and hold less and less and less and less and less. Today's banks don't have the money that you think they have. Your money is gone. They were supposed to only lend 10% and hold 90. 
But when you follow this and you say, this is our rule, this is our religion, this is the way we have to go, then you have to learn more. You have to bring in this concept. But after some time, you reach the ceiling. So much gold, so much money. You're supposed to print money according to the amount of gold you have. But now you need more money and you don't have the gold. So what do you do? You add another concept. No gold standard. That means you can print as much money as you want. Your money is fiat. It's not backed by anything. How wonderful the mind is. People worship the mind, but I question it. Look at it. Now, can you see what is this side you're getting growth, this side you're getting risk? Because it's not real. This is imaginary, this is real, and the differential is increasing exponentially. Then we said, hey, we need to borrow more money. I only have 50 crores, I need to borrow 1,000 crores. How about if I use this principle from physics that I can lift up 10 kgs by putting only 1 kg down? It's called leveraging, if any of you guys have done physics. So we applied that rule into finance and said, let the guy put 50 down, let him pick up 1,000 crores. Wow. He has only put a security of 50 and he's picked up 1,000. That's called leveraging. So we added another concept. Because you have to keep chasing a faster and faster curve. But the risk is there. What if he doesn't pay it back? So the bank said, you know what? We'll let him take an option on it. So option means that if he defaults, he has to pay a premium. Can anybody guess what that premium is? If he's taken 1,000 and put only 50 down, how much should he pay as a premium? Simple answer. This. It's the only alphabet, C, S, T, N, D, 1, S, minus this thing. The guys who came up with this got the Nobel Prize. They, well, they should. Look how complicated it is. But they used this formula in their own company called Long-Term Capital Management. They made some money for some time, and then they lost $4.6 billion. And the U.S. government bailed them out, because if they didn't, their whole economy would go down. And they didn't even take the Nobel Prize back. So that is called the Black and Scholes derivative, which is extreme mathematics. You're not betting. You're doing extreme mathematics to bet, which means I'm doing extreme mathematics to make sure that 10 lakh people lose. Is that economics? Is that a social science? What is it? It's extreme casino behavior. That's all it is. But we love it. India has got now God knows how many thousand crores of derivatives. We are welcoming them in. Then we repeal the Glass-Steagall Act. This is a little complicated. Financial banks, commercial banks. Commercial banks, you put your money. Financial banks are supposed to do business. In 1929, when the, when, the, uh, when, the, when the big crash happened in US, the government says we cannot have these together because the investment banks were taking your money and playing with it. So they separated the two. That was called the Glass-Steagall Act to protect your money. For 50 years, the bankers kept fighting with the government because they said, we can't do anything, we don't have any capital, la, 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 because now you have to go up higher and higher. By the way, this doesn't stop here. Huh? It goes way above this building. So the government says, OK, guys, you can use the depositors' money. And that's when they repealed the Glass-Steagall Act. And now they had a lot of capital to play with. And they used these three concepts, leveraging, options, and Black and Scholes derivative to create something called complex financial instruments. See, whenever you say complex, it has to be good. When you say financial, you trust it immediately. Instrument, even better. So what does it mean? Collateral debt obligation. You're dealing with debt as real things. Today, debt is sold. Wow. If I owe people money, I can actually make money on that. How silly. <laughs> How stupid. And you call it collateral debt obligation. That is the growth trap, which we have imposed on ourselves with our superior, I, I'm sorry to say, I might disagree with many other speakers, but we think that it's all about concepts, our mind, our intelligence. Intelligence is the lowest form of interaction with our reality. It is a very shallow form, intelligence. Intuition, instinct are much deeper. Emotion are much deeper. This is the growth trap. We created an idea that this is how money should go, and we'll do anything to fulfill it, even if it's not real. And this is how your reality, all resources follow this curve, but this is, I mean, God made some mistakes, you know. We're going to correct it. So look at the gap increasing, and each time you come up, to go from here to here, you come up with a new concept. To go from here to here, you come up with a new concept. To go from here to here, which is now in hundreds of trillions of dollars of imaginary, vapor, symbolic money. 
there. Unbelievable growth, crazy risk. The risk was building in the system. We were waiting for it. I don't watch cricket, but I was waiting to watch this happen. There was an explosion. That was the 2008 financial collapse which we were predicting. Why? Very simple. You're floating up there. This is a false economy. And when you reach the top, which is what we reached, the top of your resource, which actually drives things, which is called peak oil. This term is going to come into your education and in your, it's not discussed anywhere in India at least. $50 trillion evaporated. So the guy said, well, you know, it's I said they were never there. They were just creations of your mind. That was the global. So two questions again, is perpetual growth possible? Yes, if you want it of the imaginary kind, it is. It is impossible. Now, is it desirable? This is Mother Earth. I, I no, normally say this is a friend of yours. And these are his life signs. You know, your heartbeat, your cholesterol level, your body temperature, many other things, which are supposed to be flat. Just imagine that your body temperature is going crazy like this. And your heartbeat is going crazy like this. What is like this? Exponential. But this is not a person. This is our Mother Earth itself. All the life signs of the Earth, species extinction, is supposed to be, you know, intense in thousands of years. It is going exponential. Loss of tropical rainforest. So now I've come to the other side. I already explained to you why the economics collapsed. Now I'm coming to explain to you why the ecology is collapsing. Loss of tropical rainforest, this you are well aware of, which is why I speak about the other thing first, because that not many people are aware of. Fishery is exploited, exponential. I love this word exploited, you know. If you read any paper, you'll say, we must exploit these markets. We must exploit those resources. We must exploit the com uh, China's markets. Is it a good word, exploit? Would you go home and say, darling, to your wife, darling, let's exploit the kids tonight. <laughs> we haven't exploited Auntie Jessie for a while. She must be feeling lonely. Exploit means rape. Rape means exploit. So when you're saying exploit in your business meetings, in all your financial news, you just replace it with the word rape. Let's rape these resources. Let's rape the middle class. That is more accurate. We have wonderfully changed. That's the beauty about the mind and the concepts, that we can change anything. Water usage, exponential. CO2 concentration, exponential. There are 20 indicators, which are life indicators. Ozone depletion, number of cars, paper consumption. But there's one more in here, which is the trigger, which is the cause. A big, thick red line there. Can anyone guess what that is? Kind of, in a way, it is the GDP of the world. GDP is your sacred talisman. GDP going down? My God, do something, yeah? GDP going up, everybody's happy and clapping. You know, you have those two photographs in the papers, economic time. Markets are down, those guys are looking sad. Markets are up, they're they are cheering. You know, that's it. GDP of the world. When you chase the GDP of the world like this, you are going to get this. How on earth will you change the GDP of the world without taking more resources, without taking more energy, without taking more water, without taking more soil, without displacing more people? without acidifying more oceans, without drying more rivers. Now you're saying rally, rally for rivers. Why should I rally for rivers? You dried it up in the first place. You told me it's, it's all needed for growth. You told me that this is needed for growth. That is needed for growth. The Adivasi should move out for growth. We need to uh, uh, change our policies for growth. Well, that is growth. But then don't be surprised that you get all these things. Because growth is the disease. Growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of a cancer cell. Think about it, just for th three minutes. When it happens in your body, one liver cell becomes two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64. What is that called? Exponential growth. Do you love it? No, you run to Hinduja hospital. But when it happens outside and we do it, we call it progress. It's funny. But it's really true, Mr. Edward Paul Abbey, and this you will not hear in any school or university. You'll hear E is equal to MC square. I care two hoots about E is equal to MC square. 
It really doesn't matter as, as a biological creature. You'll hear all about Marx and this and that. I love Gandhi, but I'm saying if you can tell about Gandhi, surely you can say this, which is exactly what he meant in a different context. This is the thing. What is the connection between the good things which we think are good? Now we are wondering. Pollution, noise, this thing, murders, rapes, depletion. Are these really good things? Or have we just decided that they are good things? And who are they good for? This special section of human beings called civilization. Not even all human beings. So whether this is good itself is questionable. But when you do this, you are going to get this. You are going to get this. And the real cause for it is your very religion called growth. No wonder the cancer cell ends up eating the whole organ, and then moves to the next organ and calls it an emerging market. It moves from the liver to the heart. What do you think they've come to India for? This is the emerging market. This is the last organ to be eaten. This is the only place where there's clean water, cheap land, pliable politicians, etc., etc. Growth is a disease and growth, perpetual growth is impossible. So you're chasing the impossible and perpetuating the disease. Madness. The truth is, fortunately, we've reached the end of growth. What you're seeing around, your 8 lakh crores worth of NPAs, non-performing assets, Japan and negative interest rates, America $19 trillion in debt, China's growth rate falling, India's growth rate falling. It's not because of bad administration. It's not because of Mr. Jaitley. It's not because of Mr. Modi's. He tried his best. They tried their best. They opened up all the possibilities for growth to happen. It's happening because of laws of physics, thermodynamics, geology, and the fact that the earth is finite. We don't like the word finite. We keep talking about more, progress, creativity. I hate this word. Sorry. Because that was creative. All those concepts were hugely creative. And we give them Nobel Prizes. What do you mean by creative? What is the end objective? Creativity has become such a bad, such a word that, you know, when you say creativity, everybody starts bowing in front of it. What does creativity mean? For who? At what cost? Does it work? Is it holistic creativity? No, it's a narrow thing. GDP went up, creativity. End of growth is our new reality. Thank you for letting me go over my time. I think I have. End of growth is our new reality. It is our reality. It's emerging. We are in what is called energy descent. That is why all the things that you're seeing happening, read the newspaper again through this lens, and you'll suddenly see, oh my god, now I understand why this is happening. And the final truth is that either we deal with this reality, or reality will deal with us. Thank you.